worst day where I had fractures my eyes on book. And it was a compilation of interaction with the people and the places that make up the geography of the southwestern United States and northern Mexico. And it was the spring semester of my sophomore year that I went, but I felt the need to go there for about a year. And I applied to go and found myself on this trip. And about halfway through the program, we were doing, as part of this small community that integrated learning outside with adventurous things like paddling the Rio Grande or sea kayaking on the Sea of Cortez or the Gulf of California, for those of us who don't like colonialism. The experience of being with a community of learners in a new way. We had just come from the Tucson area doing a program where we had stayed with communities of faith and with families along the U.S. Mexico border in Nogales, Arizona, and Nogales, Sonora. Two cities separated by the wall. And in that time, I met some tremendously faithful people who awakened in me a curiosity about church and a new way of doing things that growing up as an Episcopal priest's kid, I hadn't quite known. These were salty pastors and their congregations who were out in the desert with big, unironic mustaches who were out filling water barrels for migrants who were crossing the desert so that they might survive the trip. Despite the political challenges on either side of that debate, they were out there saving lives as the church. And to go to tour factories where people were working just south of the border to understand what that life was like, to see some of the beauty and the struggle as well of what, it, what it's like to live in such a fierce desert landscape. Shortly after that spiritual awakening for me, I happened to be with a native tribe in Mexico, the Seri Indians, and they lived on the Gulf of California, a formerly nomadic tribe that had only settled within a recent generation. We were there to learn about their way of understanding place as they had understood it for thousands of years, trying to preserve their language trying to cling to the vestiges of a culture that was getting assimilated into the broader Mexican context. And so it was beautiful to be there. And we had been invited to church, a few friends of mine. And we had the Sunday morning off. And so my friend Leah wanted to go, and I was the better Spanish speaker and also curious. And so we went to a service. And this area had been evangelized by Pentecostals who had come and done work with them, and so we were at a Pentecostal service, and it was my first, and it was beautiful. It was a beautiful sunny day, it was hot in the desert right by the water, the worship was fervent in prayer, the music was great, and they were only just getting going two and a half hours in. <laughs> and had the service been in Spanish, I might have been more used to my friend Leah as a translator, but it was in Sarah. And they weren't talking about toads or lizards or tides. And so I didn't have a whole lot to go on. So I'm just sitting in that house of prayer and not quite connecting in the way that I wish I could. I bowed out and I took a walk. And I walked down to the beach and stared out at the glassy water reflecting the mountains that were shaped by volcanoes eons ago. And I looked down at my feet. And what does a spiritually confused Episcopalian find when walking out of a Pentecostal service in Mexico on a beach, but a chalice sitting at my feet? I looked down and there was a wooden chalice, not a coffee mug, not a plastic bag, not a plastic cup, not a beer can, but a wooden chalice. And I thought to myself, God, you have to be kidding me. <laughs> These questions about what God was leading me into came to a head in this focal image for me, and I retreated. I didn't pick it up, I didn't touch it, I didn't take a photo of it. I walked quickly back to the community center where we were staying, and I rolled out my little thermo rest mat, this little foam pad, and I took a nap, trying to sleep off what I thought was a fever dream. The Holy Spirit was messing with me on a particular day. But there's something about the adventure that we're hearing about in Acts that sense of adventure of being called to someplace new, 
led to encounter people and place in a new way. I love the way Paul and his traveling companions walk into a town and what they turn to be Macedonia, and they just kind of feel their way through the neighborhood, finding their way to where they think the worshipers of God are going to be, and they find them by the wall. And then for the Holy Spirit to speak to Paul to go in the first place, and then to speak to Lydia, this merchant in purple cloth, this business owner, a female business owner in the Roman Empire, by the way, no small feat to accomplish. Meeting together in this opportunity for the church to grow, for Lydia and her whole household to be awakened, to have something kindled by what Paul was saying to them at that time, where they wanted to be baptized and to offer up the hospitality of their home for this new thing that they wanted to do called the Jesus Movement, to be part of that. To be followers of the God of Israel, yes, but to see what God was up to in this new truth that was being delivered by Paul. There's that sense of adventure. Anyone who's been on a road trip and is a coffee addict knows you can kind of find the good stuff if you just look hard enough in any town, or at least you try. It's those experiences of seeking something out and following that sense of, kind of an intuitive sense of pull. And sometimes we know we're following it, and sometimes... It jumps up and almost bites you like a chalice on the beach. In our gospel story today, Jesus is talking to the disciples about something that's going to be a little bit more obvious. The coming of Pentecost, the arrival of the Holy Spirit, the Advocate, who will come with a rush of wind and flame, and it ain't subtle. Everyone's going to be changed on that day. And yet, Jesus is telling these things before he goes to the cross, before a bunch of terrible things will happen in their relationship before, a bunch of mysterious appearances after the resurrection and before the ascension. Jesus and the disciples have some work to do on their relationship. Jesus keeps telling them over and over again that he won't be with them forever, at least in body, and he'll be taken up to heaven. And there will be a new chapter in the history of the church that they will be called to do something new and wonderful. So they're invited today in this reading to wait, to look for that thing. Jesus doesn't live in his own world. It's something new is happening in their world. And then when it happens, they'll know. And they'll believe. When I was in the ordination process in the Diocese of Massachusetts, we were interviewing a new bishop, or candidates for a new bishop, and they described many different ways of being called into that ministry. And each of us and the question for the bishops who made the final slate, there's about five candidates, um, they were asked, what was your Damascus Road experience? When were you thrown from your horse, just like Paul was, and blinded by a flash of light, and said, I want to be considered for the bishop of Massachusetts? When did that happen? Most of the, the bishops didn't say that they had a Damascus Road experience, but one particular candidate said, you know, I didn't have a Damascus Road experience. I didn't feel blinded or thrown from a horse, but I had another experience. I had an Emmaus Road experience. And for those who know that story, and for those who could use a little reminding, the Emmaus Road was a road in which Jesus was walking along with some disciples who were dejected after his death on the cross. They didn't know the stranger walking along them was Jesus, and so he was asking them, so, so why are you guys so sad? What happened? It's almost like Uncle Barry Finn going to his own funeral. And, and he said, well, you don't know. You're the only person who doesn't know that Jesus was killed and we thought he was the Messiah. And now we're, we're broken hearted. But we're traveling down this road together. It's getting dark. Why don't you join us for a meal and have a place to stay? And as Jesus began engaging them and talking about the history of salvation and what God is up to in the world. And in the breaking of the bread, the disciples realized that it was Jesus walking along. It was an Emmaus road experience. The Holy Spirit was working with them to awaken, to open their eyes to what God was up to in their midst. The candidate who described that Emmaus road experience was Alan Gates, and he did become the Bishop of Massachusetts. That ability to name that sense of being pulled into something by the Holy Spirit, being invited in, where God shows hospitality by putting us 
together with some new people, or to have a new conversation, or to meet an old friend in a new way. Something holy happens in the moment, even if we can't quite put our finger on it. In my experience at the chalice on the beach, it would have been convenient for me as a candidate for ordination to remember that story, but for some reason it just got tucked away in a piece of my brain and I didn't talk about it. I'm still wondering what happened. Some of us may have had a mystical experience like that. And some of us may not. And that's okay, because God is the God of Pentecost, the wind and flame. But God is also the God of the Emmaus Road, where something opens up. And God is also the God who gives us a hunch to walk into a town we don't know as well, or to leave a church, to go out into the neighborhood, and to encounter someone in a new way, to see what God is up to in their lives, to listen engage, and maybe something will grow, maybe a church. It's this work that we're called to do here, not just at Trinity or at the Episcopal Church in Connecticut, but it's, it's what we do as Christians, to go from this place out into the world, to pay attention, to see the world as strangers, checking our feet for what God may have laid there. Listening for the voice of God, speaking to us from an unexpected place, like the voice of the garden at the empty tomb. God is up to amazing things. Both here in this place, as we bring new friends into the sanctuary to be part of all that we do, and the bread and wine to engage with us as we kneel and take part in the mystery that is this tiny little wafer of this drop of wine that somehow becomes for us the body of love of Christ. We get to journey in that ministry together. And each of us, as we journey to that veil, gets to go on pilgrimage, awaken to something new, perhaps a little bit sensitive to the work of the Holy Spirit here and out in the world as we take that food and are metabolized by the body of Christ out in the world. As we go forth from this place today, I want us to consider what it means to be a place of welcome. What it means to be a stranger walking in a strange land. And what it is that God might be calling us to. Because it may take 13 years to put those pieces together. But I imagine looking back, we've all had those moments that have brought us to this place today. And whether this is a chalice on the beach moment for you, or a moment that sends you out of the church to figure it out, I wish you the best of luck. And may God be with you.